but I think this is a very interesting topic we have today. We've we've hit it before, cybersecurity, but it's not going away. It's going to become even more important, I think. Today we have Dr. Rick Forno, um, a preeminent uh, uh, professor on this topic. Uh, but before we get into uh, formal introductions and our presentation today, I do want to just do our little spiel, make sure everyone knows how to use the uh, Zoom technology. So we actually use the Q&A function, not the chat function, to gather questions. Uh, chat function is, uh, is disabled. So if you want to ask a question, please find the Q&A icon on your screen. Click that. You can submit your questions anytime, anytime they come to mind. And we're actually going to be stopping uh, uh, various points during the presentation to handle any questions that we have that, are, that you've, you've submitted. We'll also have a full Q&A session at the end of the presentation as well. Keep in mind that we do have a live transcript available. It's under your control if you want it displayed or if you want it hidden. Just find the icon to click it in order to display it or to hide it. And when you when, when the webinar is finished or when you leave, you'll have the opportunity to take a, a, a survey. It's very brief. And we do encourage you to take it. If you have any problems, any Zoom problems, technical problems, uh, the best way to uh, get some help is to send an email to info at oncorelearning.net and they'll try to help you troubleshoot. Okay, and also before we get uh, started, I do want to let people know of upcoming Encore Learning um, events. The first one I want to talk about is we are going to have a virtual preview of a, a concert that is planned uh, with the Arlington Philharmonic. The uh, virtual uh, preview is Thursday, March 7th, 10 to 11 a.m. In order to find the link, you need to go to the Encore Learning website and go to uh, special events. The actual concert uh, will be held live on Sunday, March 10th, 4 p.m. at Washington Liberty High School. And in addition, there will be a uh, reception just live, uh, just prior to the concert sponsored by Encore Learning. So we hope to have you join us at all three of those events. I think that it's great that we support, people can support the local uh, symphony. And it actually is one, they're, used, they're, they're playing one of my favorite pieces, the uh, uh, Smetana um, 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 Maldo. So I, I think it'll be, it'll be great. And then we're on Monday, March 18th, we are back virtual, uh, another presentation beginning at our normal three o'clock time. And we have author uh, Tony Andrews, and she wants to have a conversation about her book, The Road to Second Chance. It's a novel about obviously having a second chance. So we actually are going to look, I think, I believe what we're going to do is we're going to allow people to raise their hand and open their mics so that, again, you can actually have a conversation with the author. So that should be a very interesting event. So with that, I'm actually going to stop my, my sharing here, hopefully. Yep. And so I want to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Rick Forno. Uh, he is the director of the Cybersecurity Graduate Program at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He advises private industry and the national security community on cybersecurity issues. He's one of the early thought leaders on the subject of cyber warfare, which has now obviously become a reality. And we are very pleased to have him and his expertise here to help us better understand cybersecurity on a personal level, as well as from a national and international perspective. So I'm looking forward to this and I hope all of you are. So with that, uh, Dr. Forno, uh, go ahead and take it away. Great, David. Let's make sure you can hear me and see me and see my slides. Yeah, your slides look great, and Excellent. we can hear you just fine. Excellent. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is uh, great to be joining you today on this um, lovely spring-like day. We're a few days ahead of springtime, but um, thank you for uh, for coming by today. Um, I come from cybersecurity from a unique perspective. My background, actually, academically, is in foreign policy and national security. Uh, I'm a self-taught geek. Two of my three degrees were in international affairs. Uh, I kind of fell into the world of IT and cybersecurity because I was good with technology. And um, at the time, back in the 90s, um, information and intelligence was becoming more digitized and was becoming more attractive to, um, to criminals and, and, and other countries. So that's how I kind of stumbled into the world of, of 
security hacking, all that sort of uh, fun stuff. Um, over the years since then, uh, my entire career has been in, in cybersecurity. I've been a hands-on keyboard geek all the way up running um, as the chief security officer at the company that for several years was at the literal center of the internet. And uh, for those of you who stick around to the end of this webinar, I, if there's time, I'll tell you how our company actually shut down large parts of the internet by accident, not just once, but twice. So if you want to hear that story, stick around to the end. So let's talk a little bit about cybersecurity, what it, what it is and what it isn't. And let's start off with kind of where the world and many people seem to think it is. This is how a lot of people, whether they're you know, the public, uh, end users, even many politicians view cybersecurity and the security world and hacking and all this kind of stuff. They view it as um, this, this fantasy belief and, and this perception that it's, you know, white males in their parents' basement with the computers or in their, their parents' attic, uh, you know, disoriented, um, the, the other person, you know, they're all dressed in black, they're, they're goth, they're, uh, they're, they're people you wouldn't normally want to associate with. And while there is a, a certain stereotype that is prevalent in the, the cybersecurity world generally, and there has been for many, many years, this stereotype has taken hold. And what, what concerns me is that a lot of people think that this really is what cybersecurity and cyber warfare is like. And in particular, I wanna to point to that image at the top where you see um, what looks like the United States under active cyber attack. That is what we call in the industry eye candy. And that's what we do when we invite VIPs or the press into our, our, our company or to the university to, to give a presentation and we want to have something that looks really sensational and glitzy and cool and shows how important cybersecurity is. And for those of you who've been around for you know, 30, 40, 50 years, that map looks very similar to what we saw during the Cold War with um, you know, nuclear, nuclear missiles. The Soviets were going to launch missiles at the United States and the U.S. is going to retaliate. So that, that mindset about you know, this global war, that, that mindset, that presentation has framed how a lot of people view cybersecurity. But to set the stage, no, cyber, cyber security and cyber warfare is nothing like this. There is no pew, 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 sci-fi special effects. And what you see in that graphic is not necessarily the case. And there is no red button that anybody can press that will launch a global cyber war. So I want to put that out in context right up front. But what really is cyber warfare and cyber security? Where does it really take place? It takes place here in much more conventional modes and environments that we many of us have worked with for, for decades. What we see here on the top left is the building in St. Petersburg, Russia, where the, uh, the Russian Internet Research Agency was launching its, its uh, cyber and influence campaigns against the United States elections in 2016 and 2020, a fairly nondescript building in a fairly nondescript city block. Nothing out of the ordinary about that, but inside, it was rows of cubicles and desks and people um, behind keyboards uh, do, doing mischief. Similarly, um, the successor to the IRA moved into a nicer digs in that lower left-hand picture, a nicer office building, where now their activities are not just cybersecurity related and influence, but they have a media empire. So now they can crank out and produce lovely disinformation and maliciously crafted videos and audios to, to cause havoc around the world from an office building. This isn't a basement, this is hiding in plain sight. And on the flip side, in the United States, in the upper right-hand corner, that is a picture of one of Microsoft's security operation centers, where the so-called good guys are monitoring you know, uh, Western networks to look for signs of, of security mischief uh, in, in the world. And in the, low, in the lower right is a picture of one of the US military cyber operation centers. Again, not very glamorous, it's an office, we have these these type of facilities in practically every company these days. It's not sensational. As I tell people many times, cybersecurity and cyber warfare, as far as being a spectator sport, is pretty darn boring. There's not a lot of spectator activity. There is no you know, flashing lights and network traffic and things like that happening. It's pretty boring if you're just sitting and watching. But of course, there is also the possibility that because of how technology has evolved, you do have the occasional you know, lone wolf actor who's sitting in a coffee shop or in their or in their their apartment somewhere causing mischief as well. 
So the reality is much different than the perception that Hollywood of the media tends to use because that's it. You know, these are easier to understand fundamentally for a lot of people than trying to describe what goes on behind these nondescript buildings in these nondescript offices. So I just want to make that clear up front about that there is a distinct difference between the fantasy of cyber and the reality of cyber. So why should we care about cybersecurity? Well, first off, what is cybersecurity? Well, the textbook definition of cybersecurity goes back to the early 1970s, and it really comes down to three key concepts. And we call that the CIA triad. No, not the CIA, the intelligence agency, but the CIA being the confidentiality and the integrity and the availability of information and information systems. The goal of cybersecurity is to protect the confidentiality of information, keeping secrets secret, protecting the integrity of information. Can we trust the information that we're seeing? Can we trust the information in our databases? And ensuring that that information is available to those who need it when they need it, provided they have the correct access. So those three simple words really underpin the entire cybersecurity discipline and industry going back you know, almost 50 years. But it's not just academic. I mean, in the uh, first 20 or 30 years of cybersecurity, it was truly um, guy, you know, scruffy guys in jeans in the basement doing, uh, doing weird things that nobody really understood that kept networks safe. But cybersecurity has become so much more mainstream now. And why we should care about it, it's, it's so important. And we'll talk about that uh, throughout today's, today's session. But we have to, before we understand why we should care about it, we have to figure out how the heck did we get here? And to do that, we have to think back the last 20 or 30 years about how technology has evolved and how the internet has penetrated all aspects of modern life. It used to be in the 1990s, you know, you would see TV commercials about logging in, logging on. Well, we don't really log in or log on anymore because we are always on. We're always connected either at home or through our mobile devices, our laptops, our cell phones, and of course our computers and other devices. So the internet really has permeated practically every aspect of modern society at both a national level with terms of communications, business, infrastructure, and of course what we do as individual users. 50 years ago, 40 years ago, computers were big, filled entire rooms. And the only way to connect into them was to be physically connected by a wire. Some of you may remember those old dumb terminals that would connect to the old IBM mainframes. Well, over and all the software and all the data that you needed was on that centralized computer. But over time, thanks to the evolution of technology and things like Moore's law, technology got more advanced, it got more decentralized, and we started pushing that centralized computer farther and farther away. So you had networks, local area networks, and companies could have their own individual networks as well. So you weren't beholden to just this one central location for all your computing power. And now in 2024, you know, we are, we've almost gone back to the beginning because through things on our, on our cell phones and our, and our tablets and our devices, those devices are now dependent on centralized computing. So if you think about it, we've gone full circle in the world of technology from centralized computing where all of our data and we were dependent on the central location and the central service to a decentralized world in the late 90s, and early 2000s, where everybody could kind of do their own thing. to now we're in this app and smart device enabled world where we are once again dependent on a centralized computing system and platform to do business and, and pretty much run our, our lives. So the internet's evolution is, is, has played a large part in why cybersecurity has become so important because the technology and the networked capabilities have become such a fundamental part of, of Western life. But along the way, and I've been one of those that even since the, uh, the mid nineties, when I was first starting off in this, in this uh, industry, uh, we, people were warning the world that we have to build things correctly. The analogy I like to use is say, you know, the smart engineer, the smart architect builds their house on rock. They don't build their house on sand, okay? Unfortunately, large parts of the internet, even today, even though we use it so much, were built upon sand 
and have remained built upon sand, even as those capabilities and resources have become far more important in our daily lives. So the fundamental fabric underlying our, our, our modern way of life is flawed. And that those flaws often come in the form of vulnerabilities and risks and threats and things that keep cybersecurity professionals like me up at night. It's very important to understand too, that the technology at the time, going back 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we didn't have things like spam in email. And I'm sure we all have email spam. Well, the reason why spam is so popular is because email itself, the underlying way that email operates, what we call a protocol, is fundamentally flawed and vulnerable to abuse. And it would be a very, we wish it would be a simple fix to just fix the problem and make the spam problem go away. But we can't because that's become so enmeshed in how the very fabric of the internet has evolved. It's impossible to wave a magic wand and, and fix these, these perennial problems. So here we are in 2024 and this modern internet as wonderful and awesome as it is, is still in many ways a house of cards built on a pile of sand. And no matter how many rocks we try to put in there to strengthen things from a cybersecurity perspective, oftentimes it's still underneath it, it's sand. So that goes a long way into explaining why we can't have nice things, why we have cybersecurity problems, why people like me remain gainfully employed in the cybersecurity world as consultants, as engineers, as researchers, as professors, as, as practitioners, because the technology is not going away. In fact, it's only getting more and more imbued and embraced by all aspects of society. So like the uh, plumbers and electricians of, of, of years ago, cybersecurity folks were in high demand because there are so many problems we have to deal with. And where these problems come from, oftentimes is because things like safety and security always follow Practice, profits, and politics. What do I mean by that? We invent something new and we make it available to the world and the world embraces it. Well, by the time the world has embraced it, we're, we, we, detect, we detect problems and maybe threats and risks and you know, issues that give us pause. But it's, at that time, it's too late for us to actually fix the problem because the world is already using, if not depending on these technologies. A great example would be Gmail, free email service. It's wonderful, it's free. We get gigabytes of free storage space for email. We save money. Well, what's the trade-off for having that free access, that, that free service and that free capability? We allow G Google to look at our inboxes and mine our, 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 and search through our inboxes for messages so they can find better ways of marketing advertisements to us, okay? Can we tell people to stop using Gmail? It's, it's a very hard, hard slog. Industry and innovation will always advance society, but the problem is oftentimes it breaks things along the way. And we see some of that now in, uh, in how the internet has evolved and where some of the cybersecurity problems, um, what the problems have, have caused for us in this world. Oftentimes, we are also very focused on the capabilities and conveniences of, of modern technology, too. We don't think about security and privacy and risks. We're like humans, we have this almost like a magpie mentality when something is shiny and new and it looks cool. We're going to rush out to embrace this technology and play with it and see if we can use it in our lives because it's cool or it's free or it's convenient. But we are often so infatuated with those conveniences and cost savings, we don't think about the other side of the equation. What are we giving up? What are the risks? What are the consequences? And we'll talk about some of these later today. Globally speaking, cybersecurity attacks are on the rise, um, you know, pretty much on a daily basis. And a big question that comes up is who's doing this? And unlike the Cold War, when if the Soviet Union launched an ICBM at the United States, we could see it from space and we knew it came from a Soviet state in cyberspace, identifying for real who is launching a cyber attack is very, very difficult, if not impossible. Uh, as an attacker can mask their tracks. And if we retaliate, we need to be sure we're retaliating against the correct um, attacker and not some innocent bystander that happened to get caught in the middle. 
And that's a, a common trick that a lot of uh, uh, hackers and uh, criminals will use to hide their tracks and continue to cause their, their mischief in cyberspace. And why can't we have nice things? Also, I think a big part of it comes down to just plain old end user, individual, personal education, okay? Do we have the ability as society to think critically about technology and how we use technology in our daily lives? I worry personally, okay, I, I just turned 50 a couple of years ago, so I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not the grumpy old man, but I do wonder, you know, are, are we, do we have a, a generation or two that is no longer able to look at technology and all these wonderful things and the advertising and the marketing and decide, do I really need this, this new feature? Or is this new feature really good for me? Or is this something that is going to cause me problems down the road? We'll talk more about these two in a few minutes. And then finally, cybersecurity in 2024. Yes, it is indeed about keeping bad people out of the networks and, and keeping your data safe and going back to the, protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information and information assets. But it's become a lot broader than just that. We're now also protecting the economic competitiveness of the United States or of our countries. We're protecting the profitability and the operations of our businesses and our infrastructures. Think back a few years ago when there was a, a, a gasoline shortage on, on the East Coast because of the uh, um, uh, colonial pipeline cybersecurity incident. Okay, this isn't, isn't just bits and bytes anymore. You know, the bits and bytes will affect large portions of our population. So the cybersecurity problem has become much more complicated in scope with far more victims innocent bystanders, and yes, attackers out there. The attackers will always have the upper hand because by their very nature, attackers break the rules so they can experiment constantly to see what might work and what doesn't work. And then in recent years, cybersecurity has also become involved in things like misinformation and disinformation and what we call influence operations. We see um, criminal groups and nation states using cyber capabilities to spread disinformation, um, vandalize internet websites to promote a certain political agenda or a certain activist message. Um, and, all, and responding to these, these things does indeed tie back to, well, what is cybersecurity? So we've come a long way over the past 40 years in cybersecurity as, as, a, as a field of study and, and as an industry. It's morphed into this blend where it's not just technical issues we have to worry about anymore, but also, you know, sort of non-technical things about how we as people and users interact with our technology, both individually and on a more broader scale um, as a nation. So having said all this, what can we do? So the first part of, the, of, of today's talk is to just give you some best practice ideas and tips about what you as individuals can do, what we as individuals can do and should do to make it less likely for um, bad things to happen to us in cyberspace. I'm not gonna say prevent getting hacked, but to do things that make it more difficult for a bad person to cause mischief against us. Some of this may be common sense, but it's worth repeating anyway. First off, keep your systems and your software updated constantly. When a new release is put out by Microsoft or Apple or Samsung, update it promptly. Set your device to automatically pull down the updates as they're released. That will make sure that your devices, your information are protected against the latest, the very latest cybersecurity threats. Oftentimes, um, vendors will detect things in, um, on the internet and fix, and, and fix vulnerabilities and problems before they become widespread. And that's so important because as defenders, we are often late to the game because we can't defend against an attack unless we know an attack is taking place. But by keeping your systems and your software current and patched and doing so promptly, you're making it more difficult for a lot of popular cyber attacks to take place. You should also um, consider your actual data, your hard drives, so your laptops or your computers. If you're on an Apple Mac system, you should uh, turn on File Vault. If you're on Windows, use something called BitLocker, both of which are free and they're on your systems. They come with your computer. And what these do is they encrypt your entire hard drive 
under a password that only you know. Why is this important? Well, if you have a laptop, if you lose your laptop somewhere or it gets stolen, your data is going to be safe. Or if you decide to upgrade your computer or sell your computer and trade it in and get something new, you if you forget to delete your hard drive, at least your data is encrypted and you're not going to voluntarily spill your secrets to somebody else. We've seen any number of cases in recent years, including by the federal government, where um, employees have had laptops stolen that had tens of thousands, if not millions of records of personal data, veterans records, medical records, personal information that were stolen and then sold to others because they were not encrypted. So a good rule of thumb is to always uh, encrypt your hard drives. It's transparent. All you do is flip a switch and you set a password. There's no complexity on your part. It's, it's very simple to do and it's good, it's good practice. Similarly, don't reuse or recycle your user IDs and your passwords across multiple sites. Uh, this is so important in an age where you've got things like artificial intelligence and machine learning that can make it very easy to try a lot of different combinations very quickly against various sites to find an account that works. One good way to deal with this is to use a password manager. And there are any number you could choose from, like 1Password um, is good. Is good. Uh, Apple has Keychain, it's built into uh, it's the Mac OS. And what, what this will do is will not only centralize all your passwords in one location, but will allow you to create unique passwords in, for each website or service that you access. And the advantage here is that if that site, that bank, that brokerage, that newspaper gets hacked and their user rosters get, get stolen, it's not going to affect your other accounts as well. A lot of people for many years would create their first email address and use that name and email address for all their accounts, banks, brokerages, newspapers, schools, um, clubs, and so forth. That's a horrible thing to do in 2024. Use a different password for each, uh, each, each, account, each service that you use. A password manager can help you keep track of them. And it's very seamless within your web browser as well. Another advantage too is or something to consider is to segregate your usernames and your accounts by, by type. So if creating a separate username and password for every site is too complicated for you or, or too cumbersome, consider creating a, a set of tiers. Okay, the top tier of sites are my bank, my brokerage, my social security account, my doctor's offices. And I'll create those and maybe use one password for all of those. But those are far more important than the password I use to log into Facebook or the Washington Post or something less important in my life. And that's a way to maybe make it a little bit more difficult for, for bad things to happen. Because again, if the Washington Post gets, gets hacked, it's not going to affect the account you use to log in at your doctor's office. So again, it's just a creative way to make things a little more challenging um, for bad things to happen to you. Hey, hey Rick. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, just uh, on the password managers, um, I was wondering if you could uh, address uh, how safe are are they? And, you know, I, I use LastPass. Mm -hmm. I got a notice from them, as you probably are aware, they got hacked, right? Yeah. And um, so I still use them, but I mean, how safe are those? And what is a person supposed to do when you get an email saying <laughs> your password manager has been hacked? <laughs> um, well, the, and that's a great question. And that was something that really, it took years for me to embrace using a password manager because I felt that same way. I didn't want to go to use a, a product or a service that had all my, my passwords because I thought, what if they get hacked? You know, then I'm, I'm, I'm screwed. That's a problem. Most of the reputable password companies, uh, password managers are pretty solid and reliable these days. There have been incidents like any technology where they've been compromised, there's been a vulnerability that was exploited. But um, what you should look for are, are password managers that allow you to uh, create your, your vault, your encrypted password archive and store it locally or store it somewhere in a way that only you have access to or that is encrypted that only you have the keys to. And I don't wanna go down this whole, a uh, big technical gobbledygook for, uh, for you today, but there are things that you should look into and I'll just drop um, this buzzword for you, end-to-end -end encryption or E2EE. -E. And what that means is that if you create a password vault and you put it in a cloud somewhere, in a cloud provider, 
even though it's sitting in the cloud provider, they will not be able to access that file because they have no idea what the encryption key is to open that file. And that makes it a little more challenging and again, raises the level of security. Um, but yeah, like everything, you know, trust but verify. Yeah, yeah. well, I think on that score, we, we do have a question from Mary on this. I think I've opened up a Pandora's box here, but uh, mm -hmm. um, what happens if you uh, lose the password manager? I think she may maybe mean lose the password. Mm -hmm. And as you just mentioned, they don't have it. So what do you do then? Well, if you lose the password to your password manager and you don't know it, um, you are um, SOL to use a, 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 an abbreviation. That's why if you do use such, such uh, a password manager, there's no harm in printing out your password and, or a post-it note, putting it in your safe deposit box or, or you know, put it in an envelope and stick it in your freezer. Having it available that you know, if you forget or God forbid you know, something happens to you and your next of kin needs to get access, they know where they can go to, to get it. Um, but if you lose your password to the password manager, unless you've created a recovery mechanism and some of them do let you do that, um, you're, you're, you're really, you know, you have to then recreate all these accounts and reset all your passwords. And it's a very, very cumbersome process. Yeah. And I guess this is related um, from Kurt. What are your thoughts on pass keys? I don't know if you want to handle this now or if it's related or want to handle it later, your choice. Um, I'll just, Kurt, I'll simply say pass keys are um, purportedly going to be the next version of passwords that will make it easier for people to use passwords without having to remember things. I'm not as up to speed on them as I should be. Uh, it's still early technology. There's not a lot of places that are supporting pass keys. Um, we have really have to see where this goes over time. I and mean, we're in the first or second innings of pass keys being rolled out globally. So stay tuned on that. Yeah, and there is one more question now that I, that I have you here. <laughs> yeah, so we'll clear this. So uh, Lynn um, uh, says, what, uh, asks, what do you think about suggesting that entities which send more than designated minimum minimum number of emails pay a minimal fee per message to discourage spam. I guess you could bifurcate bifurcate that. You know, you got your regular marketing yeah. email, but then you also have these nefarious uh, emails. I don't know if Google has a way to distinguish between. Those no, things. no, it, it's very hard to monitor to, to do something like that uh, if, to control spam. I know back in the late nineties, there were there were uh, features on some internet providers where. If I sent you an email, your server would send a, a challenge back to me, a link I had to click on to confirm that I was a human being before it delivered the note to you. Um, that was cumbersome and worked for a little while, but to charge per email, it's very going to be very unwieldy. And you, then you get into things like what they call microtransactions, where you're charging a fraction of a penny for something. And uh, that's a whole complicated thing that uh, far beyond the scope of this talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, okay, okay. Uh, um, that, that pretty much clears the uh, questions for now. All right. okay. <laughs> yeah. um, common sense would also say, you know, use things like ad blockers and other plugins to your web browsers to, um, to block a lot of the noise and junk that um, sites and, we and web browsers try to throw, uh, force on us. Um, I use Firefox as my, my web browser. It's great for supporting plugins that uh, enhance my privacy and actually improve my, my, my web experience. Uh, it's always a good practice to back up, back up your, your systems regularly. Apple has a feature called Time Machine. It's very simple, it's no frills, but it's better than nothing. Uh, that way you've got a backup copy if something happens to your laptop or your computer, it should be easier for you to recover if there's um, a problem or you spill coffee on it sometime. I'll talk a little bit later about how we manage smart devices. Um, as far as your laptops and mobile devices, don't set them to connect to strange Wi-Fi networks. A lot of times a phone will look for the nearest available Wi-Fi network and connect to it. Well, unless you trust that network, you may be opening your phone up to, uh, to problems. So uh, consider turning off the auto connect to any open Wi-Fi network. Additionally, and these are a little more um, user intensive uh, recommendations, but I think it's important to at least give them to you as food for thought. Review all the settings on any new product and service or site that you, you have. And I'll give you an example of those in a few minutes. Uh, spend time, if you create a Facebook account or a LinkedIn account, or um, um, you buy a smart home device, see what the terms of conditions say and what, 
what settings you have access to. Because by default, most of these products and services, by default, snoop on everything. And they leave it to the user to take the time to go in and turn all that stuff off. And if you don't do that, well, then you're providing you know, free data and free user tracking to the vendor um, of, of your choice. So review all the settings on, on your products. And I'll give you an example of that in a few minutes. If you have an iPad or an iPhone, two things to keep in mind, you might consider using what Apple calls advanced data protection, which makes it more difficult if your phone gets stolen or if you um, share it with somebody and they try to break into your phone at a, at a nightclub or a, a social event. Um, and turn on stolen, stolen device protection also. So if your phone gets lost, you can track it down or you could remotely delete it. And again, protect your data. Think about how much we use our phones for these days. I use my phone to deposit checks. I, I, I showed my 84 year old aunt how to use her phone to deposit checks. And she was amazed by it. Well, that's wonderful, but that phone has access to your bank. So if you lose your phone, wouldn't it be great to have a way that you could go onto a website and then just say, I've lost my phone, hit a button and delete it so that whoever found it can't do anything with your information? That seems like pretty smart advice. Goes without saying that we should not reply to suspicious texts or messages or emails and not click on links we're not expecting or which might be suspicious. We've said this for 20 years or more in the cybersecurity world. And people still do it because people are inherently, dare I say, stupid or complacent. And uh, we often click on things without thinking because we're so caught in the flow. So if you get a text message from somebody, you know, stop and think, you know, am I expecting this? Is this link legitimate? Um, am I expecting a text message from my doctor's office or the Social Security Administration? Am I expecting a UPS package to arrive? Why is the post office asking me to click a link? Those sort of things. Trust but verify. It worked during the Cold War. It works in cyberspace now. And it's important to realize, too, that you may not know if or when you've been hacked. Um, I was in Mexico uh, last fall, and one of the big uh, topics of discussion down there was how a company in Israel was um, selling software that governments could use to track down dissidents and journalists and activists um, via their iPhones. And they, they had no idea they were, being, they were being tracked or compromised until researchers in Canada discovered this and began promote, telling the world about it. So you may not know that you've been hacked. Um, and we'll talk in a little bit about how you can you know, deal with this. Um, but it, the onus, the, again, the onus here is on you. All these bullet points are, it's incumbent on the user to make these decisions about their technology, to make, take the time to look at the settings and turn off settings they might find questionable um, and configure the technology the way you want it to be used. Remember, when you buy something new, when you turn it on, chances are a lot of that technology is configured in a way who, where the primary benefit is not for you and me, it's for the, the company that sold it to you. And it's up to us to make the technology become configured in a way that works for us. And the bottom line rule of thumb is, if you're not paying for the product, people, you are the product. Gmail is free. What are we giving up to Gmail? Facebook is a great example. Facebook is wonderful. What are we giving up in exchange for using Facebook? We're giving Facebook the ability to know our friends, our locations, our activities, our patterns, our interests. And they're using that data. They're selling that data to third parties to market to us. If you think about it, in that business model, Facebook's users are not Facebook's customers. Facebook's customers are the companies trying to buy ads and place ads on Facebook and elsewhere. So if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. I myself don't use Gmail except for work where we've got a, 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 a government account. But my personal email, I pay $50 a year to a private company that is secure they don't market to me. They don't spam me. They don't monitor my account. I think $50 is a fair price to pay to ensure the email, the privacy of my inbox. So again, if you're not paying for the product, chances are we are the product. But having said all that, even with all these best practices that I just went through, and there are tons more that I, I could talk about, but we don't really have time. 
The world spins on, technology evolves, we advance. And perhaps the biggest evolution right now are all the smart things that are inundating us. Smart homes, smart TVs, smart speakers, smart cars, autonomous vehicles, all this stuff is out there. So I thought it'd be good to take a few minutes to talk about smart devices and put them not just in a cybersecurity context, but also in a more of a, of a broader context. What exactly is a smart device? Well, as the name implies, it's a device that can do more by itself or on demand than needing us to, ma to, to manually input things. Things like a speaker or a television that suddenly can stream videos from 10 different sources. A refrigerator has a screen and sensors that will tell you when the milk is going bad or that you need to buy more eggs. Or a toilet that has sensors to detect you know, how much um, a, a chemical or, or, or how much your, 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 uh, uh, your, your waste has, has um, chemicals in it that may, that may be um, a sign of an infection or, or a condition. Those are all smart devices. Teslas, Rivians, smart vehicles, you know, smart cars, self-driving cars, drones that the military uses. Smart is being pushed out everywhere. And that begs the question, do we really need to be so smart? Okay. There's an old saying back in the day, garbage in, garbage out, you know, and, and the user is the ultimate controller of things. And one of my concerns is that we have so many, we're being pushed all this smart stuff um, down our throats, right? Do we really need this? Think back to what I said earlier about embracing new technology. This stuff is great. Smart TVs are wonderful. I'm going to buy one, but what's the trade-off? What am I giving away and giving up? to get that smart capability. Even worse, what if we lose our minds? What if our, our smart devices get senile? Or as we see more and more, what if our AI devices start hallucinating and giving false information or information they think is correct, but indeed is totally fabricated? As a professor, I see this quite a bit when students submitting papers that have been run through AI services like ChatGPT and they produce perfectly sounding and readable information that is completely wrong. That's a hallucination, to use a, a common term. So things like that begs the question, what are the risks of these smart devices and their so-called smart society? And the answer is, I don't know, but I'm skeptical. You know, you can watch movies like The Terminator with Skynet and when the computers launch World War III and other, other movies where the computers run amok. Um, we're not at that point yet, but we, I think we're setting the stage to remove people from their ability to do a lot of things for themselves. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying we have to be wise in how we embrace these technologies so that we are not introducing greater risks and greater vulnerabilities to our personal lives and to our, our world at large. One thing to keep in mind about smart devices, is that smart often means it's taking place in the cloud. And the cloud usually means someone else's computer. So whenever you see a smart device marketed to you, remember that means it requires an internet connection and data from you in your home or your car is gonna to go to a third party somewhere and be analyzed to not just provide you the capabilities of that, that device, but perhaps to market to you down the road. Amazon's a great example of this. So how do we protect ourselves against smart devices? Well, everything I just said earlier, all the cybersecurity things I just mentioned, those come into play here. Thinking critically about the technology. Do I need a smart refrigerator? Well, it's more things to break, more proprietary parts. And to be honest, okay, I'm 51 years old. If I can't remember that I'm running low on milk, I've got bigger problems in my life than, than my refrigerator, okay? So think before we embrace these technologies. If you have a smart speaker, well, where is it used? How are you using it? Is it listening to you all the time? Again, these are common sense um, practices, but they're also cybersecurity practices as well. You're working you, with these smart devices, you are still working to protect the confidentiality and the integrity and the availability of your information and your livelihood. Now, speaking about artificial intelligence, I saw this a few weeks ago, and I think it makes perfect sense. So 
Someday we'll all be replaced by artificial intelligence. But old Sarge says replaced implies one already has intelligence. And this goes back to something that I worry at a much broader level that's outside the scope of today's talk. And that is, you know, with all this technology, it's great. And we're becoming producers of a lot of videos and fun things, but are we losing the ability to do and think for ourselves? And that ties back to intelligence. So the takeaway from this is smart technologies are great, but use them carefully. In my own world, I have a smart TV. I've got a 70-inch Samsung TV in the other room. It is a smart TV. I can get Netflix and Disney and Hulu and all those other fun things on it and a bunch of, bunch of channels from Samsung. But I have turned my smart TV into a dumb TV because Samsung will also be tracking everything I watch, everything I click, what services I watch and when, what programs I watch, which advertisements I see. I don't want them knowing what I watch or how I watch television or what movies I watch. So what I've done in this case, I've got this smart TV. It is on a separate network in my house. It has no internet access. And every few months, I will put it on the internet to download the latest updates to the, the hardware, and then I take it off the network again. And what that does is it turns that smart TV that's gobbling up all this, this data into a dumb TV like we used to have 30 years ago, where it's just essentially a computer monitor. And that to me, that raises the bar, makes it more challenging for um, the vendor, Samsung in this case, to monitor my viewing habits and use that stuff to market to me or, or other people. So again, that's just one example of how we can raise the bar. There are smart devices, smart appliances. When I bought a new stove like several years ago, the workers had set it up in my kitchen. And would you believe that my GE range had Wi-Fi? Why did I need an app? on my phone and Wi-Fi on my range. If I can't walk the 20 steps to my, my range to turn the, to preheat the oven, again, I've got bigger, bigger problems. The workers were still packing up the trash and I was already finding out how to turn off the Wi-Fi because I did not want my oven to be on the internet, okay? So again, those are hidden features. You've got to look for them in the product material. And if you're not comfortable with them, turn them off to make it more difficult for bad things to happen to you. I mentioned earlier, here's a free tip. For those of you who might use Amazon Alexa, you can change the wake word. I'll bet you a lot of people here who have Amazon, they probably use the default Amazon or Alexa. But you have other options you can use as well. So you can see here, I use one that is gonna be very difficult for people to know because I don't know anybody with that first name, the last one there with a Z. It also means that my, my Amazon will not get triggered by a television commercial or inadvertent conversation. And I'm not saying that word here because I've got an Amazon speaker uh, on my desk and don't want to trigger it. But just to show you, when you go through the apps and your various um, uh, devices, you can look through and see what settings you can play with to make it, again, this, this, this technology work better for you and help preserve your privacy. So I see there are a bunch more questions. Let's go ahead and take a, take a few minutes for some additional questions that came in. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, when you mentioned uh, the private uh, email uh, company, you, you definitely piqued my interest and also a number of uh, our audience members, Judith, Dolores, and Paula, all want to know, um, you know, what, what are the best services or what's the one that you use for $50? And also, uh, Judith specifically uh, asks about DuckDuckGo, whether that's a safer option. So uh, sure. DuckDuckGo is a more secure, more privacy protecting search engine compared to Google. Um, it's an option like anything else, really. It just depends if it, if it, if it search results meet your needs. If Google works for you, great. If DuckDuckGo or other, other search engines might work, feel free. As far as um, email services that I use, I use a company. Uh, they're based out of Melbourne, Australia. Um, they're called FastMail. Fast mail, one word, uh, or P.O. Box here in the States, P.O. Box.com. And they've got a bunch of different options. And again, I'm not getting recommendations or referrals, but they've been rock solid. They've been around for probably 25, 30 years. And again, all they do is provide email, calendaring, and calendaring and uh, contact management. That's it. They don't market stuff to you, they don't check your inboxes. It's very straightforward. And as I say, 
I know with them, I'm not the, I'm not the product. I'm actually a user. There were other services you could use as well, but that's the one I use. And I'm, I've got a lot of friends who use it as well. Proton Mail is another, another one you consider too. They are extremely focused on privacy and security. They're based in Switzerland. Um, they're a little bit more expensive, but um, they're another option to consider. I think also you were talking about uh, don't auto connect to um, public uh, Wi-Fi. I know I have a VPN. I think it's a Surf Shack, Surf Shark, or something like that. I mean, is that something that you would recommend uh, using? Um, sure. Yeah. Um, a VPN, for those who don't know, is a virtual private network, or essentially an encrypted tunnel between your computer and wherever you're you're trying to reach. Um, a VPN makes it. Um, raises the security of the connection. And it's a good thing if you're on a network, like if you're at an airport or if you're in a, a foreign country or at a hotel or at a conference somewhere, um, it helps ensure that you're, uh, you're, you're, the information over the, that you're transmitting and receiving is indeed private. So yes, absolutely. Uh, I use VPNs all the time. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, if you have a VPN uh, set up, I guess, would you still want to not auto connect or or... I'm sound like a professor would say it depends. Um, depending how you set up your VPN, your net, yeah, it could be okay. Um, I prefer at least what I'm on, on traveling to do things manually just so I know that it's being done. Um, but again, each each to their own. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I guess uh, step back a little bit for the on the email question. What's your opinion of Outlook email? Uh, if you reverse the words, that's my opinion. It's not Outlook. It's Lookout. Uh, I've never been a, I've never been a fan of Outlook, but uh, again, it's it, it's it's a it's run by Microsoft, good good company. I don't use it just because I'm I'm a hardcore geek, and Microsoft doesn't really you know, Outlook doesn't really appeal to me. But um, for most people, um, Outlook is, is fine. The, the client is fine, and uh, it's you know I, I, I will put them in the same category as, as as Gmail. You know, they're more than acceptable. Just again, know what you're getting into. That they may indeed be trying to you know sell you things along the way. It's like when you install a new copy of Microsoft Windows, you get a ton of advertisements popping up on your computer to buy more Microsoft stuff. Okay, you might get that in Hotmail or in Outlook Mail as well. But you know, I don't have any hard problems with it if you if you were using it. Okay, and we have a very specific uh, question. I don't know if this is something you can help with, but where do you find the advanced data protection? and stolen device protection. I could not see it in the settings. I guess it depends on whether it's Android I, Android or iPhone. So I, I don't know if that's something sure. they can direct the, people how to get to. Sure, or sure. Um, uh, I'll simply say, uh, again, to sound like a professor, check with Dr. Google. Uh, just Google advanced data recovery or stolen device protection, and uh, it'll take you to Apple's um, instruction page for how you can enable it. And I'm sure if you just you know say, and Android, it'll find a way to, whatever the Android equivalent may be as well. And just so you know, I've got, a, I've, I've got another module or two to talk about as well. So this isn't the end of the whole talk. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, on YouTube too, I find, you know, there's lots of YouTube mm -hmm. um, things that yeah. on uh, that will walk you through something, something like that, yeah. Sure. Uh, now, um, here's a, hmm, okay, so Susan says, what cyber, th threat that we don't normally hear much about, are you most worried about? Okay. I, I'm, I'm worried about the ones that I don't know about. I'm worried about the ones that um, those more knowledgeable than me, those who may be um, far more cleared in the US government, the intelligence world know about than, than me. Uh, I can only speculate, um, but I, I'm more concerned about Na nations and nation states than I am about organized crime and criminals. So you saw last week the um, Department of Homeland Security uh, at least and the White House released a, an executive order looking to remove all the Chinese made cranes from US ports because they have embedded systems that were made in China and they may be connected to the internet. I'm worried about companies, countries that have, we have products from certain countries that are supporting our infrastructure. You know, Chinese surveillance cameras, that Chinese made surveillance cameras used by an American company, and they may be deployed at a federal agency, or um, routers, network devices that route internet traffic, having back doors to China or Russia because they were, you know, the, the software that runs these routers was, you know, exploited 
further on the supply chain. So I'm more worried about the low, what you can call the low and slow stealthy kind of placing all the chess pieces on the board and then wondering at what point does everything suddenly just erupt? Um, I don't mean to sound paranoia, but uh, it's those sort of targeted infrastructure things that concern me. So, so are, uh, are you advocating as the, you know, there's lots of more and more people that are preppers, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not suggesting becoming a, a prepper, uh, but it certainly is good to have, you know, you know, a couple of bits of water inside and things. I mean, we can all survive it, hopefully survive a, a couple of days. And we've all lived through blizzards before where we've lost power. Right. I do. I do fill up uh, old uh, uh, gallon milk uh, jugs with water. My wife laughs at me, but I think, you know, Hey, why not? <laughs> You know, like for example, me being a being a, a more of a hardcore geek, you know, I have got some older older technology that you know, an old laptop that I have that I keep it, you know, as a backup in case you know, something happens. I need, you know, my laptop gets shorted out or something like that. But you know, I've got another cell phone as a backup in case I lose mine or something happens. But now you don't need to be a prepper. Um, but you know, the, again, think think about you know where technology falls in your life. I mean, if you have an entirely smart house and your smart devices suddenly die or you have no internet access and the smart devices can't communicate, well, your smart house suddenly becomes very, very dumb and you can't raise and lower the window shades and your locks may not work, you know? So, you know, what's, what's your plan B in that case? You know, can you still open the front door with, it, with an old traditional key or are you dependent on, you know, a smart device? So those sort of things um, I think are good to consider, but no, don't be a prepper. Yeah, no, that's a good point with the uh, electronic uh, key locks. And I guess if your entire house is that way, uh, if, well, they have a battery, right? So it doesn't depend on electricity, but. Um, yes, but if a smart device can't reach its home, its mothership uh, to, to validate the connection and validate, you know, the request to enter, you know, that smart device becomes paralyzed. Oh, those things actually need connectivity? Yes, I, I have I have a smart th uh, thermometer, a thermostat on my my air conditioner, and yes, it talks to my cell phone when I'm home. But when I'm away, if I want to turn the air conditioner or heat on when I'm on campus or if I'm on travel, okay, I log into the app, but the app is talking to the thermostat ma manufacturer's cloud to process my request to send it down to my to my thermostat, and vice versa. The sensors I have to detect temperature and humidity, that data goes from my sensors in home into the vendor's cloud to my phone. Right, but the lock where you just punch in a number. It depends on the type of lock and how it's set up. Okay, okay. Well, that's something to think about. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's um, go ahead and take one more question before so I can move on. Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, Nancy says, why are... Uh, or, uh, yeah, why are some websites always asking us to use the app to, uh, oh yeah, like Washington Post, uh, uh -huh. um, they, they always direct you to the right. app uh, to, to use their services. Sure. I think they do that for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, if they get you to use the app, they've got more control over the user experience and what's presented to you and what ads are presented. And um, you know, they can more easily track what, you're, what you do while you're in the app. Um, if they, if, if you use the website, you can, like I said, ad blockers and other things can make it more difficult for them to track your use. And, you know, um, and they don't get as much value from your relationship with them as if you use the app, but really they're asking you to play in their sandbox where they control everything. If you go to the Washington Post website in your web browser, you've got a fair amount of control over how that website is presented to you and what data gets reported back to the Washington Post. In an app, the app is in control and not you. Yeah. Okay. So, we, do have, we do have lots of other questions, but go ahead and um, maybe some of the well, questions we'll have, yeah, we'll have, your presentation. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So these are all great questions and, uh, and kudos to the audience for, um, you know, for staying with me and, and, and asking some really, really good questions. Not... I think I understood, you know, Stan, where much of the audience is and sort of the, you know, the demographics involved. So I thought it would be good to take a minute or two and talk about an issue that really, I think, is probably near and dear to, to a lot of people um, these days, and, and the question of identity theft. 
uh, and that really affects people across generations. Certainly, um, you know, uh, uh, seniors are far more likely to be uh, to be targeted um, for various reasons as they have been in the traditional you know, postal service. But it's important generally, I think it's worth spending a few minutes to talk about this and, and why it's so important. Generally speaking, identity theft is happening constantly. Um, just a couple of years ago, if you, if you do the math, I mean, there was a, a one case happening every 22 seconds. I think last year it was down to like one case every 17 seconds. The financial losses can be staggering. I mean, again, in 2022, the losses in the US alone were over $10 billion just due to identity theft and fraud and things like that. So this is a huge problem for the internet. And a lot of it, it this really is a cybersecurity problem as you might well imagine. Now you might think, yeah, sure, it's not going to happen to me. Well, trust me, folks, it will happen to you. It happens to all of us, happens to me repeatedly. I think I've got probably another 20 years of free credit monitoring that's been given to me for the number of incidents that my data has been caught in various um, hacking uh, incidents. It's happened and it will happen. It happens from a variety of ways. And I, I'm not going to go through all of these, but your information is out there, whether you know it or not. Technology makes it very easy for bad people to get this information and to try to use this information against us. Uh, and compared to where we were even 10 years ago, things like artificial intelligence and machine learning makes identity theft far more um, successful because there's a lot more intelligence and computing power behind it. Technology makes it very simple. So what are some examples of, of, of identity theft and ways where this may become a problem. So here are a few examples. Text messages on, your, on the left-hand side of your screen. Unsolicited out of the blue, you get a text message from somebody from Social Security Administration Department of USA. That doesn't sound too normal. Social Security Administration Department of USA? I've never heard of that before. My Social Security number has been suspended? Oh, mercy me. So just please um, call me back and we'll, we'll figure it out. Obvious red flag. If anybody calls that number or responds to a text like that, they're probably going to be asked to fork over personal information. Their name, their, their, uh, social, their real social security number, their in other information that could be used against them to open up new bank accounts and credit card numbers and mortgages and things like that. That's been going on for many years. We also see cases more and more now of what we call delivery spam where you get a note allegedly from FedEx or UPS or the Postal Service saying that a package has been at the warehouse and can't be delivered, please click this link to verify your address. You click the link, it'll ask you to fork over your information as well, or worse, it may actually download malicious code or what we used to call a virus to your phone or your computer and turn your computer into you know, a, a tool that the bad guys can use. These are unsolicited, unapproved, unauthorized, text messages that would not come from a legitimate government agency or company. More prevalently uh, in, in the campus world, I see emails all the time that are sent to all the students in my department. Um, I'm looking for a student lab worker. It pays, you know, 250 bucks a week. It can be done remotely, which for a student is pretty cool. If interested, please send resume and contact for me to review immediately. Signed, Dr. Jenkins, associate professor. But I tell students, well, first off, verify is Dr. Jenkins even a legitimate professor in the department? Okay. Well, if you look at the email address, Dr. Jenkins, that doesn't look like a professor's email address to me. Info for you own now at Gmail. That's, that doesn't make sense. Again, trust, but verify. I also get a ton of emails allegedly from Anthony Blinken, U.S. Secretary of State. I'm trying to reach you to discuss important business item. What is your settlement number? First off, the English grammar is wonderful. Secondly, the punctuation is horrible. Thirdly, why is Anthony Blinken emailing me from a Yahoo account in the United Kingdom? And fourthly, why is the Secretary of State wanting to contact me directly? He has people for that, right? So these are often examples of emails that are being are sent out to try to get you to, to fork over personal information. I've seen this also in the case of, of allegedly from doctor's appointment, doctor's offices and hospitals. De uh, dear, doc dear Rick, your, your test results are ready. Please click on this link to view them. And it comes from an address I don't recognize. So again, trust but verify. 
What we see a lot of too, and I'm sure many of you do as well, messages like this. If you see, if you use Gmail and you see a big red banner, that's a good indication that this message is dangerous. In this case, I got an email saying that this address, my password will expire today and I'm required to update by clicking the link. Never do this, okay? First off, you don't know where that link is gonna go if you click it. And number two, my, my it's common knowledge that most internet companies and organizations are not gonna email you a note like this. But yet, people still click on these links because there's an urgency. Oh my gosh, I mean, my email account might expire. It sounds high pressure, it's not. And that's the trick that criminals have used for years, even before the internet. High pressure sales pitches, high pressure con jobs, okay? And the internet makes it so much easier to do. Don't fall for it. So what do we do about identity theft? Boils down to three things, deter, detect, and defend. By deter, we, we try to protect ourselves. How do we do that? We do everything I mentioned an hour ago, practice safe computing, make sure we're updated and we're, we're patched and we're doing all these things correctly and, and properly. Use Wi-Fi carefully. And as we just talked about, consider using a, a VPN, a private network, or, or connecting not to the airport Wi-Fi, but use the Wi-Fi on your cell phone. Most cell phone plans include a hotspot. Use it, you're paying for it. That's a higher degree of um, trust than an airport's open Wi-Fi where who knows who might be lurking on it. I mentioned compartmentalization about usernames and passwords. I'll talk more about that in a, in, again in a minute. Don't overshare your information in your life on social media. Social media is great. We can share pictures and videos and things like that with friends and family. But be careful. If you post on Facebook, you know, the wife and I are going to California for three weeks and we'll be back at the end of, end of March. And you come home and you find that your, your house has been broken into and all your valuables are gone. Your insurance company may not cover your losses because you were stupid enough to say, tell the world we're going out of town and our house will be unguarded. So don't overshare on social media. Consider blacking out things like your license plate number. You, you know, uh, blur the license plate numbers. Blur any, if you say, have a picture of a house address or a credit card, you know, take steps to make it more difficult for somebody inadvertently to see this information and use it against you. Protect your social security number, your taxpayer number. That's been age old uh, guidance for decades. And also consider using credit cards to pay for things instead of debit cards or checks. Credit card losses are capped at only $50 per card when you report it. But an ATM card or a debit card, they tend to have higher loss risks, meaning you're responsible for more of the loss if there's an incident. Uh, and if you use a check, sometimes you put a stop payment on it and that requires a stop payment fee and there's more work for you. So I tell people, if you're paying for things online or even you know, if you can write it down, use the credit card number to get a higher degree of consumer protection. Monitor your credit reports. The federal government mandates that um, every year citizens can get free copies of their three big credit reports. Pull your credit reports every year from the three big bureaus. See if there's any um, things suspicious on there, any accounts that were created without your knowledge or any requests for your information. Monitor your credit score. A lot of credit card companies allow you to monitor your credit card score for free. If you're still using paper documents, shred them before you throw them away. Don't just throw them away in, in the bag out, um, out in front of your house. You never know who's gonna come by and pick them up. You never know who is going to be at the junkyard or the garbage place looking for your bills and your receipts and your information to get personal information. I tell people in 2024, I think most places are pretty safe that you can consider using paperless statements and invoices um, for banks and brokerage statements and credit cards. Um, less paper to lose and, and keep track of and it goes directly to your inbox. And if your computer is encrypted, again, it's a higher degree of certainty. I say again, trust but verify. And apply common sense. Hopefully we all do that. And not just computing, but generally. Throughout time, you should also, um, in terms of detecting when there may be a problem for you to deal with identity theft, look for signs of unusual activity. If you get your credit statements, look for any odd transactions or if you get a spending alert from your credit card company or there's suddenly less money in your bank account than you thought. That might be a clue that there's something amiss. 
Maybe your credit score went from nearly perfect to only middling. Well, ha- what caused that 200 point drop in your credit score last year? Maybe something happened that you need to look at. Perhaps you get email alerts or phone that your password or accounts have been changed or a request was made to change your password. Did you make the request to change your password? If not, somebody may be trying to change the password to get into your account. You know you've got a problem um, and, uh, if you start getting real collection aid calls or, or letters from collection agencies and you know good and darn well you have nothing to be in collection about. That's a definite sign that there's something suspicious happening. If you get an increase in email spam messages, that's probably a clue that your email address has been caught up somewhere and is being used for malicious purposes, identity theft or fraud or, or whatnot. It is not the end of the world. My email addresses have been compromised, but it's just something to be aware of. And finally, if you use a credit card or a check at a, at a, at a retailer and they suddenly deny it, that might be a clue too that um, one of your accounts may have a problem somewhere and it might be worth um, investigating. So what happens? We're a victim. Oh my gosh, what do we do? First off, do not panic. But you should act quickly and contact the entities you deal with. If you think your information has been compromised, contact your bank, your brokers, your brokerages, change your passwords on those accounts if, if, you, if you want to. Again, just make raise the bar, make it a little more challenging, just in case. Changing passwords is easy these days. If it is, if you think you really have a major identity theft incident on your hands, consider filing a police report formally. It's good to have a paper trail for the insurance companies. If you're seeking a reimbursement, oftentimes they'll ask you for a copy of the police report. Always monitor your records, your finances records, your history for anything that may look suspicious. Certainly your credit card companies will call you or contact you if they notice suspicious transactions. That's happened to me a couple of times in recent years when um, one of my Visa cards that I rarely used was suddenly being used for purchases in Brazil. My bank called me and they said, are you using these, this card in Brazil? I said, no. And right away, six o'clock on a Friday evening, we changed my credit card number and the charges went away. So monitor your finances closely for anything suspicious. Also place fraud alerts on your credit record. So you know if there's a problem or if there's a fraud alert with your identity information that the bureaus know about. But even better, Consider freezing your credit reports. And the difference here is that when you freeze your credit report, your information cannot be used by a bank or a credit card or somebody else to open new accounts. The credit bureaus will not give that access information out. So if you, by freezing the credit report, you know, if you've got your credit cards and your mortgage and your car loans, you're golden. They'll be able to keep getting their information to verify who you are. But if somebody tries to buy a new house or a new car in your name and the bank tries to run your information, if your records are frozen, that information will not go out. You'll be notified that somebody was trying to to use your credit records and you'll know that somebody has been targeting you. There are five bullet points here, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. Those are the three big credit bureaus. Um, Check Systems and Innovis are two companies that do the credit bureau thing for banks. So the first three are for credit cards mainly, the latter two are for banks. I have like my, my credit records are locked at all five of those. And if I need to unlock it, it's a simple phone call or I go to a website, I unlock it, the credit that the card dealer runs the, uh, the, the credit check and then I lock it right back up again. The advantage there, again, I've minimized the exposure of my information to be used against me. And a side benefit too of locking your credit records, you'll get less postal spam from banks, brokerages, credit cards, retirement communities, and everything else. So um, that's another side benefit. So now let's take a minute and talk about some creative ways to defend your personal information. And maybe you've thought of these, maybe you haven't. We've all had to create security questions, but nobody says you've got to be truthful in those security questions. So for example, when I ask, what is my first car? Maybe I'll write down my favorite food. The city I was born in was Hogwarts. I don't think so. My best friend's name is Salmon, my favorite fish. And I'm pretty sure my mother's maiden name is not Chewbacca from Star Wars. But if this information is in the system, I know what the answers are and the system knows what the answers are, but a bad guy won't. And a bad guy can use things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and looking at social media 
to figure out what my first car was or where I was born or my best friend's name or my mother's maiden name. But they'll be very hard pressed to know the answers to these questions. So consider fudging your security questions. Just make sure you remember what the answers are. That's a creative technique that I, I, I use. And a lot of people kind of go, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Nobody said you had to be honest. Another thing to consider too, masking your payment information. And we're almost done here. Um, a service I use is called privacy.com. And that allows me to generate virtual credit card numbers that I can control by how much I allow it to be spent on the card, how, how long the card is open for, and so forth. I can disable the card. I can enable the card. This is great for subscription services. If you forget to unsubscribe somewhere, once that value of that card runs out, the company, the streaming company will not charge you because they're not getting paid. So uh, if you're buying something on the internet, maybe consider using privacy.com and creating a virtual uh, credit card number for um, the flower shop or a virtual credit card number for streaming services or a virtual credit card number for magazine subscriptions. And then you've again, compartmentalized your payment flow and you've made it more difficult for one incident somewhere to affect everything in your world. And then similarly, consider using one-time email addresses uh, as well. Um, there are free services that will let, let you create a temporary email address for a one-time sign-up of a newsletter. That might be worth considering. Apple has a service where you can um, use uh, uh, their, 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 their services to create temporary email addresses per site. So you could have one email address for Paramount Plus streaming, one, a different email address for Netflix, another one for Amazon, and so forth. And you'll get all those emails sent to you. But again, it's a unique identifier for each company. And what we're doing here again, we're making it more difficult for our personal information to be used against us. And we're making it more difficult for an into cybersecurity incident affecting our information to cause greater damage to us. We're making, we're, we're, we're trying to minimize. It's like think of watertight doors on a ship. We're trying to make sure that we've got enough watertight compartments and doors to make it more difficult for the, or make it easier for the ship to stay afloat. Some additional information about identity theft, visit identitytheft.gov or the Internet Crime Complaint Center for more information from the, from the federal government about um, identity theft, what to do, how to deal with it. For broader cybersecurity concerns as well, here are some additional resources. Uh, Stop Thinking Connect is something uh, run by the, uh, by, the, by the government. Um, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency offers a range of best practice guidance as well, something to consider. Again, these are all tips for you to use. It'll say pretty much what I've said today and give you a lot more information as well. Have I been pwned? And that's a, that's a geek term, P-O-W-N, pwned. It's good to see if your email address has been compromised um, and where it was compromised. So if your email address has you know, been compromised 30 or 40 times over the past decade, Maybe it's time to change your email address. Bottom line here is that sometimes there's only so much that we can do ourselves. We can do a lot on our end, but in the modern world, we are still um, at the mercy of companies also doing the right thing to protect our user data as well. And just because uh, I mentioned Have I Been Pwned, it does happen to everybody. This is one of my campus email addresses and, oh look, it was, ca it was caught in a, um, a data breach back in November, 2018. So it happens to everybody, all right? So the key takeaway from all of this here today is, if you think about it, people are responsible for everything. We attack our systems, we defend the systems. We prosecute, we investigate them. We write the laws and the policies. We develop the systems, we deploy the systems, we administer the systems. We use them and we abuse them. Ultimately, the goal of cybersecurity is to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information and our information resources. Oftentimes, it's going to come down to people, both on our end, you and me, and those who we do business with. But it comes down to user awareness, user education, and for us exercising a dose of common sense to do the right thing and try to be more positive, take greater control over our information and our online presence. And with that, I'm happy to stop and take questions. Okay, yeah, we have about a dozen questions and uh, not a whole lot of time, so maybe kind of rapid fire <laughs> session here, but what are your thoughts on TikTok? I don't use it. Um, it's popular. Uh, there are some concerns with, the, with it being a Chinese, uh, Chinese company. Uh, 
like any platform, it just depends how it's used, but there certainly stands to be some, uh, some, some oversight somewhere along the way. Um, so, I mean, are they grabbing our data? I guess is that's uh, the, probably the question. Yeah, it, oh, absolutely. If you, if, if, you, if you watch TikTok in an app, you're in TikTok's app, they're monitoring what you watch. You're logged in. If you log into TikTok, your account is kind of a history of all the things that you've watched. And, that and they history. grab data on your phone. I guess that's what I've yeah. heard that they can possibly swat, you know, um, get, get all the other information, not just what you are watching. It depends on the type of phone, obviously, and how the phone is configured. Um, but depending on the phone, yeah, they, they, they could get more information like your location and your whereabouts uh, or, you know, in, in, in the world. But yeah, it, it is a concern as with any social media place. I mean, again, most of these apps are, are downloaded and installed with all these things turned on by default. And we have to be smart enough to go in and turn them off or at least know what's tracking us. Okay. What's your opinion on Windows 11? I assume this from a security standpoint, not from a, how easy it is to use it. That's a whole other session, I guess. Um, I have a long track record of hating on Microsoft. So I, I don't use Windows, uh, Windows at all. I haven't used it for 20 plus years. So I'll say uh, use it at your own risk. But if it works for you, Godspeed. <laughs> okay. And why can't we trace who's making anonymous threats to public figures? Very good question. Uh, well, again, technology makes it very easy. If you think about uh, the number of uh, unsolicited telemarketer calls you get, the number may show up as being Arlington, Virginia, or Falls Church, Virginia, or someplace in, in the US. That caller ID information has probably been faked. And it's probably coming from a call center in the Philippines or you know, South America or South Asia. Uh, technology makes it very easy to hide our tracks in cyberspace, which is why I said before, it's very challenging um, to find the true culprits, whether it's a spam attack or a hack attack or making uh, threats. If you're, if you're crafty enough, you, you can probably get away with it. Okay. What are your thoughts on Apple Pay? Again, I guess from a security standpoint, primarily. I think Apple Pay, I use it. I think it's um, more, it's more convenient and it's more secure than using a credit card because when you use Apple Pay, you're not actually dropping your credit card information at the store. You, hold, you tap your phone to the, to the computer, to the reader at, at Giant or, 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 or the retailer, and your credit card number is not exchanged as it would be with a credit card. What is exchanged is a mathematical algorithm, I, I'm trying to keep it really simple, that validates your identity, your credit card number, and the amount you're charging, and it sends that information to the, vent, to the vendor. So there's less chance of your credit, there's no chance of your credit card number being compromised because that credit card number never leaves your phone. And, and same thing goes for Google Pay, I presume? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay, what, what do you think about identity theft insurance? Uh, if you wanna do it, do it. Uh, um, some companies offer it, um, I don't have it, but uh, may not be a bad thing. Yeah. Well, and kind of related to that, what do you, uh, how do you know if you've been hacked and what can you do about it? Well, as I said before, uh, if, you know, you have, uh, you know, signs like, you know, if you're getting weird alerts from your banks, your, your brokerages saying your, your accounts, you know, log in from Korea. Well, I never went to Korea, so it couldn't be a legitimate login. Or if you're getting, um, you know, alerts that your password has been changed or a request was made to change your password. Those are all signs that your account it may not be actively targeted specifically for you, but it's caught up in some broader cyber attack. That happened to me a few years ago with Apple, when my original iCloud account with Apple was um, was compromised. And I kept getting alerts from Apple saying it was locking me out of my own Apple account because of the number of password attempts that were being generated every hour. So I had to create a whole new Apple ID um, and then turn on some additional security to get around that. So that to me was a clue that my email was being used to, or was part of a larger cyber incident. Okay, and we have uh, someone um, says, can we get a copy of the slides? Will you give us sites? You've talked about, actually, I just let people know that, you know, Encore Learning really isn't set up to push out slides. We are hoping, I mean, we are recording this and we're hoping to post it to YouTube. So you can rewatch this uh, hopefully on YouTube, just uh, uh, it, we may not get up there for another uh, four or five days, but uh, if we do get it up there, you just go to Encore Learning and navigate uh, to find our YouTube site or just search on YouTube actually. So that, that's, your, that's your best bet. We, but we're not really set up to uh, push out 
uh, slides to audience members since we don't have your um, uh, necessary information. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, what do I do if I get the uh, email saying there's been a request for password change? Uh, what about when Facebook account has been spoofed uh, so that your friends are getting weird stuff supposedly from you? Uh, I, th I think that's happened to a lot of people. So I, I guess kind of two, two questions in there. Sure. Um, well, I'm not on Facebook, never have been, never will be. So um, I'll speak um, anecdotally or kind of from a third uh, third party perspective. Um, it's, if you get the alerts and, you know, if, if you can validate that your account was compromised, if there's like a, a history in Facebook where you could see uh, login attempts and where they came from, that might be a clue that, yeah, your, your account was being targeted. But more often than not, I think a lot of these are just, you know, spam or um, people trying to find people they can trick into giving away their, um, uh, remember those emails that I showed you where your, your password's expired, click a link to reset your password. Well, they're expecting people to click on that link that goes to a website they control, the bad guys control, to, to create a new, a new password that they will then turn around and use to log in as you. So in the absence of, of specifics, I would say you can probably safely disregard a lot of those alerts unless they truly come from Facebook. Okay. And uh, Nancy uh, um, asked, what other bad stuff might happen to us from cybersecurity concerns besides being targeted more accurately for things that we buy? And I, you know, I guess, I don't know if she's, uh, obviously, if you buy a smart device, uh, you, you kind of talk a lot about that. And I don't know if it's not a smart device. I mean, unless they're embedding nefarious uh, cameras or or microphones, uh, I guess, like it's just a furniture, we're, we're, we're safe with that still, right? Yeah, I mean, but it's hard, though. For example, you know, the new, if you have a Roomba, those things are great. They roll around the house, they vacuum and they mop. Well, okay, the newer ones um, will map your house out. And that mapping data is not stored on the Roomba, it's stored in the cloud. Well, who owns Roomba? I believe Amazon is in the process of trying to buy them. Well, that so now you've got a map of your house stored in somebody else's computer. That may or may not be a, a concern for you. Uh, so there, you, you have to think that way. You have to you know take a broader perspective on these devices and where that data is being is being sent. Um, it may yeah, it may not, nothing we might we might not think about our right. Problem. Yeah, correct. Okay, and let's see. Um, here's a couple, a couple of very specific ones. So um, one of them. Uh, so I have an, they have an Apple Watch and an iPhone, and they got it in case of the fall an emergency. Right. Um, but uh, um, you know, it jumps in the conversations a, a person is having, and so the question is: um, Are all the conversations available at Apple? And if they turn off that conversation ability, uh, will it still work for the intended? Uh, purpose of uh, being able to call emergency. If you, well, I believe when you hear something, if your Apple watch or your, or your iPhone talks to you, it's just talking to you through your headphones. It's not listening in on your conversation per se. Um, my understanding is that Apple does not listen in on, on your phone conversations. So you probably can turn off those voice notifications in some settings somewhere on the watch or on the phone if you want to. So it's still gonna pick pick you up if you say some magic word or something? Or... Well, I mean, if you fall, if you turn off voice notifications, if you fall, it's presumably still gonna call for help if you fall. Oh, oh, because of the, uh, um, um, well, how, how would it do that if it's not picking up your voice? Well, the microphone, I mean, it, well, the fall, fall detection does not, on the Apple Watch or the phone, is not listening for you to fall. It's not listening for you to drop a glass. It's monitoring the position of your body and the speed at oh. which the body moves towards down, essentially. And once it detects that, or there's an impact or a velocity, you're going from 90, 90 miles an hour to zero, that probably means you're probably in a car crash. Gotcha, it will, gotcha. It, that it will use those sensors to place the emergency call. It has nothing to do with Siri listening for you to say, change the radio station. Right, okay, gotcha. Thanks for clarifying that. And also, uh, Kenneth asked, um, <clears throat> I haven't heard of any hospital systems hacked recently for ransoms. What has changed that if it's true? Um, it's it's still whole, happening. Think, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah ransomware is still happening. I didn't want to go down that path. Again, it's a very complicated thing. But no, ransomware, where a uh, um, piece of um, software locks up a computer or a series of computers and holds the data ransom, 
is perhaps the number one favorite cyber attack these days. We've seen hospital systems, public school systems, large cities, including Baltimore and Atlanta, crippled by these type of attacks that required thousands of man hours to literally reinstall and recreate thousands of computers from scratch. Um, yeah. There is still a huge problem. I simply say that's because a lot of these places, local governments, small governments, hospitals, they don't have the, the, the financial and staffing resources to have really, really strong cybersecurity and IT, IT support for everything. It's an understandable problem, but unfortunately it creates a, a, a concern. Right, and just uh, one more very specific, uh, Barry is asking about LastPass, if he's generating 18 characters uh, for a uh, generated password, is that is that good enough? I, I mean, I think it's good, right? uh, no, 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 Gary, I think you should have 36, only for you. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. Well, <laughs> um, it's a quick, quick, si quick side story. Um, for decades, the guidance was, you know, your passwords must be eight or 12 or 16 characters, alphanumeric letters and numbers, special symbols. And then about four or five years ago, the government researcher who developed the original guidance said, you know, with all the computing power we have now, we don't need to do this anymore. I mean, passwords can be cracked pretty, pretty easily. And it, it kind of caused waves in, in the cybersecurity world because folks are so conditioned to doing that. But no, if you've got passwords that are, you know, eight to 15 characters, you know, mix of things, you should be okay. I don't see a problem with that. Yeah. Okay, uh, great. I think someone mentioned that you promised an anecdote or something. Maybe you just gave it. Um, oh, well, if we have time for a, a quick one, one or two, I can certainly. Uh... Okay, sure. If you're if you're if you're right. willing, go ahead. All right. So back during the, the dot com days in the late nineties, early two thousands, I was working at the company at the center of the internet, and what that means is that the company, our sole purpose was to maintain the internet's phone directory that would match company names with where they were on the internet, names and addresses. Microsoft and the internet address for Microsoft. Well, on more than a few occasions, we were in such a rush during .com that we let quality assurance measures slip and we would push out a half empty phone book. And we did this every day. Uh, we would issue out the phone book every day with new updates and new changes. Well, on more than a few occasions, we would put out a file, a phone book that would only say Microsoft.com, Apple.com, Arlington.gov but we didn't include the address. And when you would try to go to you type in Microsoft.com in your web browser, your browser would just crash, would not crash, it would time out, couldn't find the site. The whole internet was designed to have Microsoft.com translated into a numeric address on the internet. And our servers, we kind of forgot to put out that second part of the, of, of, of the, of the directory. So we had to rush through, but uh, there were some times where there were a few periods where large swaths of the internet in the dot-com domain, we, um, we, we took offline because we were so such in a hurry to, put, to push out the, the latest update. So we learned some hard lessons back then, and um, thankfully that never happened again, but uh, we, we learned, learned and learned fast from that. So yes, I have the dubious honor of being of working for a company and seeing us paralyze large parts of the internet um, for a few times. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that story. And, you know, I feel like this is a topic we could probably go hours uh, and still not get to the bottom of it, but mm -hmm. I really appreciate you taking the time and, you know, we had over a hundred people uh, join us and obviously a lot of people with questions and I hope that uh, um, people are, are, um, got their, uh, 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 felt, felt good about the responses. I think uh, you were able to cover, cover every, everything that they threw at you. So we really appreciate that. And uh, thank the audience for uh, joining us on this uh, wonderful afternoon. And I don't know, any parting words you might have, uh, Rick? Yeah, I, I would simply say thank everybody as well for sticking around. Uh, thank you. I see the icons, the thumbs up. That, um, hopefully this made sense. I'm, I'm glad it did for those. Um, parting words, I would say, take this um, not as gloom and doom, but just as a warning to be diligent. Uh, don't lie awake at night. Don't panic. Don't go rushing out to, to change everything in your life. But just be aware that, you know, the world we live in is much more networked and much more interconnected. And we have to be a bit more diligent in how we interact with technology because it's such a part of our fundamental world these days. So again, thank you very much for joining us today and um, have a great afternoon. Yeah. And just like, I guess all those cop shows be safe out there, right? <laughs>